how we're doing uh, in that process. Uh, and then um, part of the meeting, we're going to do a little education around just evaluating the ends and, and what we need to be looking at before we actually start looking at the actual report. I need to choose a meeting evaluator. Um, so do we have a volunteer? Is a meeting evaluation? Uh -huh. I can do it. Right. Do you have a coffee or need I one? I have. You do? Person. Bless your heart. that we can affect is 
to move forward in good faith um, with trying to work out some, some solutions to some problems that are unique to this year. Um, so, Ozzy just wants to say hi. Hi, Ozzy. First support of um, So, um, yeah, anyway, I just, I just wanted to, to, to say that and to say that I'm not sure if anyone else is going to speak up tonight. There's, you know, a number of people here, and I would be surprised if if too many of them are here, or I would be surprised if many of them are not here because they have some sort of similar story to what to what I just shared of having the, the work that they do and care about doing for your kids thrown off kilter by the, by the lack of clarity. And we feel like um, you know starting these negotiations up is just a way to really um, not solve all those problems, but but really move move forward in a good direction on solving many of them. So thanks all. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, do we have anyone else? I'm not seeing any. Is there a is there a way to see any raised hands if there are raised yes, hands? They will show you. It will oh, show up. Yes. Okay. So I don't see none. Um, I think we'll we'll close off. Does anybody else see it? I'm not seeing any. <laughs> um, we'll we'll close off public comment at at this point. Um, I added uh, just a little. Uh, Thing to the agenda, there's a um, talk that's that's going to be done by um, a sort of a 21st century uh, career and career and life planning speaker. Um, it's going to be a virtual presentation. Um, it would cost $75 per board member, but in uh, relation to just sort of looking at our ends and understanding kind of the future and what uh, students need as they move forward in their lives. lives. Um, I was wondering if it was something that the board um, might want to invest in, in terms of just educating ourselves in terms of the future needs of students to be successful in their lives after their education. So I had sent the stuff out to folks and I wondered if anybody um, had questions or thought that might be worth the board uh, investing the time into looking in, into that. And was that again? Uh, it's, it's a talk that uh, this He's, he's basically sort of a career pathways. He's pretty well known nationally. The Tech Center has been working with him on uh, career paths, but he he has he's a national speaker on sort of what students need um, in the you know this current generation of kids as they look forward to um, planning what they're going to do after. Uh, after high school or after their their initial schooling. Um, so is it something we have to go to? I'm just going to date. It's a virtual. It's a virtual thing. Okay. Um, and he's going to be just presenting stuff about sort of uh, the younger generation and kind of the way they think about life. He's going to. There are going to be uh, people from industry and and the business world sort of look speaking about the kinds of skills and things that they are needing um, for future employees. Um, and there are going to be people, people there. Um, it's sort of, it's being um, run for sort of higher ed is also going to be there sort of hearing about what, you know, what what's needed from you know, for students and um, 
for employees or for employers. Uh, so it's just it's just a chance to sort of hear what the thinking is about you know what what students need to be thinking about as they start planning for their future and what we need to be providing for them in terms of education and outcomes. Um, so it's October 21st, what time? Yeah, two, to four. Four. Two, two to four. Yeah. And I, 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 maybe I'm a cheapskate, but that seems a little steep per yeah. person for a presentation. And if it's during working hours, I'm not gonna be able to do it anyway, but. Okay. Yeah. Well, and when I looked at it, at first, I'm a little naive. I thought it was going to be free, uh, and then I realized, oh, it's going to cost. So, I, but I still wanted to at least see if see what people thought because part of our education needs to be kind of thinking about what skills do we need to be making sure that our students have by the time they finish high school to be able to move forward. Um, and I know the Tech Center has been doing a lot with this work, and we might be able to have um, Jason Finley from the Tech Center has been involved with that pretty heavily, um, and he might be able to um, speak a little bit to what they've learned there um, to just help us uh, just kind of think about and, and as we're evaluating our ends, because that's going to be Part of what we're doing this year is just looking at our ends and just making sure we're on, on track with, with the outcomes that we're looking for um, for the entire system. So I and I'm not wedded to this, so I'm I'm totally okay with uh, not doing it, but I just wanted to at least have a discussion about it. So next up is um, Remember that part of what we're doing as we um, go through our monitoring process is we're also just looking at our policies and making sure we understand sort of what they are and then just understanding the process of monitoring uh, those policies. So this is the big one that we're doing tonight because these are the outcomes. It is a looking back time. So we're looking back and of course we're looking back on, you know, the outcomes that we achieved under COVID, which is, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, that's a little bit difficult right there. Um, just given the circumstances, um, no one would have predicted we would be in a worldwide pandemic and uh, so um, it's it's sort of hard but at the same time I think going through the process and understanding um, what we're looking at and being clear on the interpretations even if there's uh, non-compliance to you know because there's no data um, at least we are we are going through that process and so we had asked you to review a little bit, just sort of ends monitoring, um, ends in general. Um, so I was just wondering as people went through some of the stuff from our training over the summer, if questions came up or if um, people were unclear about things as we move forward. And we did get that ENDS report a little bit late. Um, Lane, I just have a quick question for you. Are you gonna sort of walk us through that ENDS report? Or? Um... The, pur the purpose of the presentation tonight is to walk through the ENDS okay, report. Okay, perfect. Uh, so perfect. hopefully that will help. It's a long presentation, so I've tried to actually about very specific notes to make sure that we're getting to the specifics and the nuance and I'm not um, talking for hours at you. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so as people reviewed sort of this process, did anybody have either concerns or questions or uh, anything in regard to um, looking and monitoring?
monitoring ends. executive limitations uh, reports that are in our packets. This is just the first review, so uh, we'll, be, um, we'll be looking at uh, accepting those the next time, so those are just in your packet to review. Uh, and what about the strategic plan integration discussion? Was that part so of So that was, um, so part of what we're going to be looking at is some of what was what are in the ends are um, are the the strategic plan that was put together. Part of it is our our part of that is to look at our ends, communicate out to the community. This is where we are with ends. Um, and then also uh, take a look to see if we want to uh, reach out to the community and be, specify more in the end. So dive down a little bit uh, deeper, be more detailed in what we're what the outcomes are what, that we're looking for. Um, because right now, just if you look in that strategic plan, we're basically just. Uh, updating any of our ends. Mm -hmm. So so that's the piece that we're we're working that's on. That's the integration. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Um, so we talked about the new the EO policies that we're going to be reviewing and we'll vote on accepting those the next time. Um, which then brings us to uh, the actual ends report from Lane. And again, what we want to be thinking about as we as we hear this report is we're looking at the, his interpretation of the end, and we're asking ourselves, is this a reasonable interpretation? And that interpretation should uh, allow us to have the way we're gonna we're gonna um, be evaluating whether or not he's he's met it is he's gonna give us some data, and we're gonna say, did his data match the interpretation and is he in, in, in compliance or not. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're ready for it, Lane. Were there questions on um, executive limitations or are we? Oh. At this point, because we're just reviewing them, I'm not sure if people have any from the from the first review. And I can say for myself, I, I had a very busy week, <laughs> and um, I wasn't able. I haven't even had a chance to actually review that. And I was the only thing that I've reviewed so far is your ends report prior to this. All right, so give me a moment to get this pulled up. Okay. A couple of things to know. Uh, first off, I cannot see you during the presentation, so I apologize for that. Um, if you see me looking off to my left or down, it's because I have my notes there. Um, and I want to make sure that people can actually see the presentation on their screens at this time. Yes, yes, we yes. can. Perfect. I appreciate that. A couple of uh, further pieces of info. And you please tell me if I'm not speaking loud enough. Um, I found that if I don't talk too loud, uh, I can preserve my voice a little bit. But um, as far as the ends go, um, what Ann had started off saying about, you know, part of what you're looking at is, are they reasonable? So that's the first question. And if you determine that they're reasonable and that you're not happy, then the typical process is to go back and put another layer 
in terms of your 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 end state uh, that kind of puts a, a little bit stricter guidelines on, on on my interpretations so a couple of things here uh, in terms of the ends report that we want to talk about and I call it kind of the the cautions and the context given um, you know the pandemic that we've been going through um, the ends only focuses on a limited set of data it just focuses on the data sets required to measure achievement of the ends and that's important because there is plenty of other data that's out there in terms of our school's uh, performance um, it's worth kind of reviewing if we get the time but if it's not directly tied to the ends interpretations it will not be in this report and the other thing that I want to say is that that report is actually very informationally dense. Um, there are, I noticed about six typos um, when I had a chance to look at it again with fresher eyes that I will correct before um, it comes back to you for next month. Um, secondly, uh, remember kind of what Ann was saying, the report looks at the past year. Therefore, any conclusions should be regarded with a great deal of skepticism. Data collected during the pandemic was incomplete, missing, and of questionable validity and reliability because last year in no way resembled a normal school year. In this piece, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, in terms of why it was in, at times really difficult to figure out the interpretations. And so I want to kind of explain this a little bit because I think it's important for folks to know. Um, it should be noted that policy governance is a very good model, but it is a business model and therefore encounters some difficulties in terms of goals and how to measure progress when it is translated to education. In the business world, things are tangible. You can see them, you can feel them. So goal setting is easier, right? Profits will increase by 10%. The sales team will acquire 15 new accounts each month. In education, goals are incredibly hard to measure because they are focused on changing the processes that occur inside the human mind. And the only way to measure such a thing is indirectly and often imperfectly. I received criticism in the past because the ENDS report was so long. It has to be because the governance model we are using is not a good fit for educational goals. If you ask me to increase productivity, on the factory floor, I can interpret that and state how progress towards it will be measured in one sentence. If you ask me, however, to ensure students have foundational knowledge in the arts, that's going to require a long response and no measurement tool will ever adequately assess the changes inside a human mind that are required through compliance with such a goal. Lastly, the report takes into account the fact that the board has nine different ends that are so broad they encompass and impact every student and staff member across the district, which means pursuing any of these ends will have a significant budgetary cost, and that pursuing all of the ends at the same time would result in a budget increase that is higher than can be borne or justified in the community. Therefore, I have interpreted that there are three types of ends, mature ends, critical ends, and perspective ends. Mature ends are those that the district has spent significant effort in achieving, and which have, come, have become self-sustaining above their achievement thresholds. Since it costs more to do the work of achieving an end than it does to sustain it, once an end becomes mature, those resources can be shifted to other priorities. Given limited resources, critical ends are those that are currently the focus of our improvement efforts. Our last category of ends are called prospective ends, which indicates that they will be pursued in the future when limited resources can be shifted to their achievement. So the way that this uh, process should work so that we're not asking for three or four million dollars from the community to work on all these ends at once, is that we have the critical ends that we're working on. Uh, we currently have four to five of them. Once those ends mature, once they are achieving the levels that we've set out for them consistently, we don't have to spend as much money um, doing the training, professional development, buying the supplies and the other resources that are necessary. 
and we can shift those resources to some of the prospective events, those that are waiting to be done in the future. So it's kind of an important way of interpreting things, um, and it's due to the budgetary constraints. Of the board's nine ends, our current resources are being used to main two mature ends and to advance four critical ends. This will be three prospective ends to be addressed in the future when the critical ends have matured and resources can be shifted to their achievement. Just a quick primer for folks that are kind of um, checking in from the outside uh, who are board members uh, and may not have a lot of background in this. Um, ends are the board's goals for the district. Interpretations are how the leadership team has chosen to define the board's goals in terms of what is to be achieved. Interpretations do not state the means that will be used to reach the goal. Instead, they state what measurement will be used to show that the goal has been reached. An interpretation is considered reasonable if what is being measured logically indicates success of the board's goal. Each interpretation also sets a threshold that defines the level of achievement that must be reached for the goal to be considered complete or in policy governance language in compliance. The purpose of this yearly ends report is to use objective data to show if the ends have been achieved and if not, where they currently stand relative to their achievement thresholds. The policy team sets the highest and most global standard in terms of what it means to be successful on the ends collectively. Because of this, interpreting the preamble provides an opportunity to develop the broad strategies we will use to achieve the ends. What it means to have the knowledge, skills, and tools to be prepared for the next stage of their lives was clearly defined in the latter half of the 20th century when a nationwide initiative called the New Standards Project was funded by the federal government to research what skills students would need to be successful in the new economy that was unfolding, which was based on digital information sharing and high technology. The results of their research were codified into the 21st century skills, the Common Core Learning Standards, and the Next Generation Science Standards. Therefore, it makes sense that any improvement efforts must incorporate these three sets of standards and skills. The district will be in compliance with the overall policy as compared to being in compliance with its enumerations. When two conditions are met, when all mature ends are self-sustaining, and when all critical ends are advancing towards their achievement thresholds. Due to the impact of COVID, which has delayed, altered, and prevented the normal collection of data, no valid assessment can be made in terms of the district's compliance with this overall policy. All that can be said right now is that work is continuing towards the critical ends and progress is being made. Now we want to kind of go through uh, the board's more specific ends, right? We talked a little bit about the broad, the broad end, the overall, that encapsulates the overall policy, but these are the enumerations. Um, end 1.1, uh, that the board has set down relates to critical thinking. In terms of interpreting this, um, we looked at a, a number of things and we've decided that assessment of student performance on the senior project is an ideal means to measure achievement of this end as it requires students to apply what they have learned across their OSSD careers to solve unique problems. Further, students must communicate their process and findings, effectively use appropriate technology to explain their solutions. Because of this, the senior project rubric evaluates students on all the components related to critical thinking and is uniquely suited to measuring achievement of this end. Evident. Um, just a note here. Um, so that folks know the senior project, like a lot of things, was significantly modified last year to adapt to the constraints placed upon its normal process by COVID. Therefore, the data collected from the senior project rubrics last year cannot reliably be used to determine compliance with this end. Furthermore, um, because of the changes in the process, last year's data cannot be compared meaningfully to previous years. 
Um, the data that's presented here is from the last year prior to COVID. Additionally, the board has established six foundational knowledge ends related to English, mathematics, science, social studies, life skills, and the arts. Three of those ends, English, mathematics, and science, are a current focus for improvement efforts and are therefore critical ends. They were prioritized because they are the most visible to the outside world, and they drive the perception of the quality of our schools, especially to new families moving into Vermont. Lastly, achievement in these three areas is required under federal law for the state and the district to continue receiving federal grant monies. The first of those ends, which is a critical end, calls for students to possess comprehensive knowledge of a core curriculum in the following areas, reading, writing, and communication. The English language SBAC was chosen to measure attainment of this end because it assesses student achievement on the common core language standards, which include reading, writing, and communication. Our performance relative to the state average was chosen because Vermont is one of the few states that has equalized spending on education across its district. Because funding correlates to student achievement, equal funding should also equalize student performance. In other words, all things being equal, every district should perform about as well as every other district. We have allowed for a three point variance from the state average because all assessments, including the SBAC, have measurement error. Measurement error is the total variance in scores that would be seen if the same students took the test several times. In terms of the percentage of students reaching proficiency on an SBAC type exam, that variance amounts to about three percentage points. If you look at some evidence, um, if you look at zero and you go up that line, what you are seeing, uh, those numbers, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, those are grades. And we'll talk a little bit about, about what they mean. This graph represents the difference between the percentage of OSSD students achieving ELA proficiency and the percentage of students statewide achieving proficiency in each grade three through nine. Those are the grades that the SBAC is administered in. For illustration, so people understand how to read this graph, if you take a look at grade four, what this graph is telling you is that our fourth grade population achieved 2% fewer, let me go back again, 2% fewer of our fourth grade population achieve proficiency compared to the state. And that would be within our 3% variance. In terms of this provision, the district is in compliance in grades three, four, five, seven, and eight. The district is out of compliance in grades six and nine. Based on this data, this provision does not yet meet the definition of a mature end. Because it's not a mature end, we have to go to that set, second caveat about whether growth is occurring, right? Because this is a critical end. And so this graph is a means of measuring growth over time in ELA. In 2019, on average, 7% fewer of our students in each grade reached ELA proficiency compared to the state. In 2021, however, on average, 2% fewer of our students reach proficiency in each grade relative to the state. Since we are gaining on the state, this critical end is improving towards its achievement threshold, and therefore I can report compliance. Board's end 1.22 calls for students to possess comprehensive knowledge of a core curriculum in mathematics. Mathematics SBAC was chosen because it too assesses student achievement on the common core learning standards, which were interpreted as vital to compliance with this overall policy. And the rationale behind the interpretation for math is the same as that that was discussed for reading, writing, and the communication end. This graph represents the difference between the percentage of OSSD students achieving mathematics proficiency 
and the percentage of students statewide achieving proficiency in each grade three through nine. For illustration, 4% more of our eighth grade population achieved proficiency compared to the state. In terms of this provision, the district is in compliance in grades five, seven, and eight. Oops, excuse me. You go back. Yes. In terms of this provision, the district is in compliance in grades five, seven, and eight. The district is out of compliance, therefore, in grades three, four, six, and nine. Based on this data, this provision does not yet meet the definition of a mature end. So then the question becomes, is it, since this is a critical end, is growth occurring towards the standard that we've set? The above graph is a means of measuring growth over time in mathematics. In 2009, on average, 5.6% fewer of our students in each grade reached mathematical proficiency compared to the state. In 2021, on average, 4.8% fewer of our students reach proficiency in each grade relative to the state. Since this critical end is improving towards its achievement threshold, I report compliance. Words in 1.23 calls for students to possess comprehensive knowledge of science. The Vermont Science Assessment was chosen because it assesses student achievement on the next generation science standards, which were interpreted as vital to, the, to compliance with this overall policy. <laughs> the rationale behind the interpretation is the same as that discussed for the English and Mathematics SBAC as this instrument is similar. The graph above represents the difference between the percentage of OSSD students achieving science proficiency and the percentage of students statewide achieving proficiency in each grade 5, 8, and 11. And uh, they only take uh, the Vermont science assessments in those three grades. For illustration purposes, 1% more of our eighth grade population achieve proficiency compared to the state. In terms of the, this uh, provision, the district is in compliance in grades five and eight. The district is out of compliance in grade 11. Based on this data, this provision does not yet meet the definition of mature end. Therefore, we have to look at it as a critical end. The above graph is a means of measuring growth over time. In 2019, on average, 10.3% fewer of our students in each grade reach science proficiency compared to the state. In 2021, on average, 0.3% fewer of our students reach proficiency relative to the state. Since this critical end is improving towards its achievement threshold, I report The board's foundational knowledge ends in social studies, life skills, and the arts are all prospective ends. In other words, we don't have enough money to do them all at once. So these guys are important, but they're waiting for the future. They're waiting for some of our critical ends to become mature ends so that we can shift the resources we're using to improve those um, to improve these. Uh, uh, they will be pursued in the future and the critical ends have matured and their resources can be shifted to support this work. That said, it is still important to examine how the district has interpreted these perspectives. Let's take a look. Social studies. Since this end requires students to possess comprehensive and foundational knowledge in social studies, the best way to assess the acquisition of that knowledge is with a criterion reference test. These types of assessments are used to measure student mastery of a preset body of knowledge and skills. That body of knowledge, that body of knowledge would be the current nationally accepted social studies standards as defined by the National Council for the Social Studies. An end of year cumulative examination will also tell us through two things. Did the students master the requisite knowledge and skills? And two, did they retain the knowledge and skills they mastered? Foundational knowledge implies something that sticks with the students so they can build upon it. If that knowledge is only remembered for a short time after it is learned, it cannot be considered foundational. Further, 
Since critical thinking requires a framework of acquired knowledge to draw from, successful retention of social studies knowledge and skills will support the board's critical thinking end. It was clear during the strategic planning session that the school community values the idea of the district providing training in basic life skills. Unfortunately, other than financial literacy, those skills were not well defined during that process. Once resources and funding can be shifted from supporting the current critical ends, a team of parents, students, staff, and local business leaders will be drawn together to flesh out the totality of the OSSP Bill's curriculum and how it will be delivered. Since the fine and performing arts produce tangible displays, something you can see, something you can hold in your hand, that allows students to demonstrate their mastery of arts knowledge and skills, it makes sense that the best way to measure that mastery is through a performance assessment. A rubric that uses objective measures to assess a student's artwork or performance on specific standards is an effective way to provide feedback on the achievement of this end. And in the case of the fine arts, the standards that rubric would be based upon are the national core art standards. And students would need to achieve a score of meets in the four areas that those standards support. Creating, performing, presenting, or producing, responding, and connecting. And this rubric would be developed locally. The board's N 1.3 calls for students to be adaptable, resilient, and able to manage change. This is a critical end. It's one we are exerting resources towards improving. This end um, requires multiple data sources to ensure that information from all students contributes to the evaluation of compliance. The capability to manage the demands of the day-to-day -day changes we all face is reflected in our ability to be consistent and dependable when it comes to our attendance. Therefore, attendance is a valid means of measuring a person's ability to adapt to the temporary changes that affect their recruitment. Bullet two. The magnitude of change the students face as they progress through their middle and high school years is immense. They transition from being children to adults, physically, emotionally, and intellectually, and they transition from being dependent to independent. Their ability to successfully navigate these challenges is easily measured by the percentage who make it through to graduation in four years, making a district's graduation rate an effective measure of their adaptability. In terms of bullet three, in general, students with disabilities often need assistance identifying and internalizing strategies for learning that allow them to compensate for the effects of their disability. The very act of learning those strategies and using them effectively enough to either no longer need an IEP or to move along the continuum towards being on a less restrictive IEP is by its very definition adaptation. The data on average daily attendance is not reliable given last year's extended remote sessions, so there's not much to show. The graduation rates have not yet been released by the state. We got a message today that the state data um, should be released hopefully uh, by early January. The thing that we do have is we do have data related to the third bullet, which relates to our students who are being serviced by IEPs. Now, this data is a bit funky, so I, I've got to explain it a little bit. First off, the graph shows the percentage of the district's overall population that is served by an IEP. So in 20, uh, a little over 21% of our entire population was served by an IEP. If you believe this data, and you shouldn't, and I'll explain why in a second, in 2021, it would be 22.4% of our entire population was being served by an IEP. This data is inaccurate because many regular education students over 53 last year chose to hold the school due to the COVID pandemic, which caused the calculated percentage to rise despite the fact that the number of students on IEPs remained steady. We had 190 um, in the previous year and 191 this current year. 
Had those homeschooled students remained in school, the percentage would have been level between last year and this year. This is a super important one. This is the second part of the interpretation. This graph shows the average severity rating of student IEPs. A higher number indicates a greater level of service. The poor can range between one and six. There has been a clear decline in the severity of student IEPs over the past year. Compliance with this provision is unknown due to some of the necessary data being either unavailable or unreliable due to the COVID pandemic. Then the last end, um, and this is a mature end, and this is digital literacy. Um, the board expects that students use and apply information and technology appropriately, effectively, and objectively. We interpret this as meaning all students will use a Chromebook, a computer, or tablet in a developmentally appropriate manner as the primary means of producing, managing, enhancing, and delivering their school-related work. In terms of the rationale for this interpretation, since the board description of this end relates to digital literacy, it makes sense to use the American Library Association's definition of digital literacy as the guide to what constitutes compliance with this end. And that definition is almost the same as the board's. The ability to use information and communication technologies, ICTs, to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information. The interpret interpretation, therefore, is reasonable because it embodies all the components of the ALA's definition, and the ALA's definition matches the board's description of this end. In terms of evidence, the um, best way to measure the acquisition of a defined skill set is to require the effective use of that skill set. By switching to a one-to-one -one model as the district has done, which requires students to use ICT devices as a primary means of learning and engagement, each student every day demonstrates compliance with this end. And all of our students use these tools from K to 12. Um, like I denoted a little bit earlier, give me a second to switch back to a screen where I can see people. Um, there are some typos um, that I've got to fix, which should be fixed in the actual written report um, before the next board meeting. Now, with all that, which was a lot, and I apologize, I'll shut up for a little while in case the board has questions.
read the whole thing earlier today and I was mm -hmm. able to, you know, decipher all that Lane just said. And it seems like when we vote, we vote on whether to accept that he presented the information correctly. So if we don't like the information, then how do we go back in and like change the policy so it says that we need to change this and this and this? I guess that's my question. So what we're looking at now is 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 his interpretation of each of those ends. Is it reasonable, right? Given what we've given him, so it's they're extremely broad. So what he's presented to us is his interpretation of those broad ends, and how he would, how he's gonna. That interpretation includes how am I going to measure and the rationale for why I'm using that measurement. Um, there are a few of those ends where. He hasn't interpreted them. Uh, those are his prospective ends. So we as a board need to decide, do we feel that that interpretation, are we okay with that interpretation? That he doesn't have the time, he's, he's, not, he's got a plan for interpreting them, but he just hasn't done it yet. Um, now, if there are interpretations for all of the ends, the perspective means that the work has not commenced yet because of budgetary constraints. Okay. Um, the, for example, the four critical ends that we are working on, um, I was trying to add up the total cost. You're probably in the $750,000 million range right now. So if we were to work on the additional three or four, um, especially given where the district is starting from, um, that I walked in without a lot of this work completed. There were pockets of it, but, but not a lot. You are looking at a significant cost should we work on them all at once, but the interpretations are there. Right. Uh, just we haven't been working on them, so there's no evidence that that's being gathered at this point in time. Right. So in voting to accept it, we're accepting we're that accepting his, his plan is to, yeah, once the resources can be Put there. I do really appreciate the, the kind of compartmentalizing of them. I mean, as we several of us have said, they're very broad. Yeah. Um, so uh, focusing in and breaking them up like that makes sense. I wonder about the, for instance, the graduation rate. If if we don't have that from the state until January, would we revisit? that just so we would have the information we will have already accepted the report but the ones that we don't yet have data for we revisit them so what we would do in that case is he's, he's not in compliance until we have that data so he it would be we would revisit that particular one once he has that data but he has a ton when 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 a, when they're not in compliance what we need to look at is when will you be in compliance what's the plan when can we expect some compliance in that in that area and sometimes there's a hold up because of the data that we're that he's using to um, back up his interpretation This is Ashley, and I have a question. Um, when you mentioned the cost associated with bringing some of these into compliance, um, it's a pretty staggering number. Is that number that high because of um, needing to add staff, needing to modify curriculum? Where? What is that staff. hurdle? Yeah, a very, a very good question. It's. It's in some cases, it was adding staff like the RISE program, um, right? Um, the students can't access any of what we're doing unless we deal with the trauma-based behaviors that we're seeing. So we've added uh, staff to the RISE program. We've added staff um, for mental health services at RUHS. Um, there's probably three or 400,000 there. Um, 
We also have to do curriculum alignment, so there's the paying of stipends um, to have that work done, and often a trained facilitator to come in and facilitate that work. There's a professional development that goes along with that, like um, we're currently engaged in the Lead to Read program uh, through the Stern Center, which was $100,000 over the next two years to get uh, the teachers the skills they need to really get down to the, the discrete skills that the students need to learn um, to be able to decode and decipher, which is a problem across the state as a whole. And so the costs, like I said, they, they run the gamut um, when you take on these broad ends. I'm not, um, I, I want people to know, I think this work is incredibly important and valuable, so I'm, I'm, I'm not decrying that. But I'm just saying that if we're gonna do these and um, achieve them well, um, it takes time, it takes investment. And if we try to do them all at once, we could, you know, you're going to have to hire another body or two to be able to manage what I can, uh, because there's only one of me uh, man managing the district. Um, to be able to pick up those other pieces, we would probably have to have another a director or two. Um, and then you've got the same issues of professional development, curriculum alignment, potentially purchasing new materials and resources like with mathematics. You know, we were doing this transition over to the Carnegie um, math program, you know, that was $50,000. So these things are not cheap. So just, it's a very good question. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad question that you just asked. Um, so I apologize if I hit, haven't hit all the components. Yeah, I'm just going to say that and then comparison to the 2021 results. And I'm just wondering, um, is that all the complete, do we have complete data from the state and from the student testing for that? Are those equal comparisons? So 20, uh, so 20 is missing because that was the, that was, that was uh, a year that they didn't do testing. Um, and I apologize, my mind's a little, little foggy. Uh, being sick but um, those two data points again there's two ways to look at them um, 2019 represents the last year before COVID where testing was done <clears throat> 2021 was the end of last year was last spring which was during COVID so it's kind of interesting. I mean, I could make the claim that, heck, look at how much things improved relative to the state during COVID. Um, that means you must be doing some right, but I, I, I'm not prepared to make that claim, um, if that makes sense. Um, so can you really compare the data? I don't think so. I, would, I wouldn't do it. It's, it's much happier when you, when, you, when you have clean data from regular school years to be able to compare and see. The reality is, is that, that that we improved over the over the state um, quite significantly um, during the time of COVID. So, you know, kudos to the teachers and everybody that pulled together to get that work done. The other other caveat that I would point out, um, I think it's important is um, you know there is a lot of data out there right the federal government and the state defines what data it is that we need to submit and they do that for a reason because it is a it's what they consider um, measures of educational quality it would be good to look at how our SBAC scores have changed over time but since that is not a part of the ENDS interpretations it's not in there I'd love to be able to sit down and, and show that data to you but again the ENDS report was very specific Right, the, 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 the benchmark that we set, because um, Vermont's all about equality, was, was the state average. Um, and so what I did is I showed you the data that was required to show you how we were doing relative to the state average. I, I don't know, I'm, I must have heard this wrong, I'm thinking. 
But I think you just said don't trust the data that you presented as evidence that we're doing something right. Did I hear that wrong? I'm saying that you are trying to compare data from two specific different years. You are trying to compare data from a year when students spent a lot of time in remote session to a year when students had a regular school year. So the question then becomes, is it valid to compare the two? Most people would argue not. What you could interpret it as meaning as we had pretty significant gains relative to the state under extreme conditions last year during COVID. So it means we did a better job than a lot of the state in terms of how we manage learning during pandemic. Right, it's kind of like attendance. Attendance, the way that attendance was taken during remote sessions um, was dramatically different than how you take attendance during a normal school year when there's not COVID. So can you really compare those the, the, those two data with any pieces of data when they have have much meaning? Probably not. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm make, making sense to you. Some sense, yes. Okay. Thank you.
structure things so that you need it and build a budget so that you can work on all of these ends at the same time, I'm happy to do that. I don't think it's going to pass, um, but I am happy to, to, to do that work. In terms of the timeline, um, you know, I can guesstimate, but we're in the middle of a pandemic that is ever changing. Uh, and I have de facto given you a timeline. We will work on the prospective ends when the critical ends have matured, when they are consistently for three years staying above the achievement levels that we've set. So I did that, you know, very purposely knowing all the issues that we're going to be facing with COVID and all the changes that are going to be happening in terms of budget, which we'll talk a little bit about later, like the back 173 and the healthcare negotiations that are going on. I put that in there because the timeline is really indefinite. It depends. It um, depends on a lot. And there is a tremendous amount of work to do on these critical ends. Um, whether the district realizes it or not, I, we spoke about it um, probably three years ago um, in an ends, ends uh, discussion, was the idea that the district um, has a lot of growth to do. Um, you know, we're not we're not starting out you know at 100 percent across the board we're, we're starting out you know moderate to moderately low and so there's a lot of work to do uh, to get us up to you know the achievement levels that we've set if that if, I, if i'm making sense <clears throat> Again, my intent is not to convince you, it's just explaining my rationale. You guys have to decide if it's reasonable. Right. So I guess this is Chelsea. Um, I guess for discussion purposes, I feel like it's absolutely reasonable. Like the the three, what are they called? Mature ends. Mature ends, and then per critical. perspective, critical, the critical ones are the ones that we're working on. Seem to have made progress. It seems like things are headed in the right direction. I don't know if everyone feels this way, but I feel like it's unfortunate that there isn't enough funding to be able to also incorporate the perspective end into what we're doing right now. And if there isn't the funding, I mean, I don't think this is the time or the place to talk about that, but at some point, maybe we should talk about what that funding looks like and where can we like tap into more funding. I don't know if because we're a public school, it has to come from the state or from the town, or if there's like fundraising options, or I mean, like, I, I don't know, but I, it seems unfortunate to be limited just by finances when I feel like everyone in our community would be super excited to make our school a lot better and would probably, if they were, if they could, would put money into it. But I don't, I mean, those are just totally off the base thoughts. But on um, the ends report, it seems like they are reasonable interpretations to me. Actually, Chelsea, you, you bring up a, a, a very good point. Um, there's also uh, a limitation in terms of, of personnel to be able to do this work, especially at the elementary level. Um, remember that the elementary teachers often teach all or most of the disciplines. And so it's very difficult um, for them to be engaged in math and science and ELA at the same time, right? If we're doing um, improvements in math and science and ELA at the high school, it's a little bit different because there's three separate groups of people that are doing them. Whereas with the elementary um, folks, they would have to be doing them all at once, which would be overwhelming to anybody. 
So there's a, another kind of just more of a physical structural constraint there. As opposed to just financial. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can overcome the structural constraints with finances, but they, they can get expensive very quickly. So do we want to pay all the elementary teachers to come in if they're willing to do it full time over the over a summer to get the work done? Mm -hmm. Right, it would fundamentally change the structure of how the school operates. So I agree with Chelsea in that um, considering situation we're in the availability of information that Lane had to draw down from um, I am comfortable with accepting this report as presented and thank you Lane for the time and energy you put into it seems like it, it should affect all students and the discussion um, that was had at the time was there were concerns that senior project itself were, was potentially driving students out of the district to pursue those other options and so that was kind of where the discussion ended when with COVID so you're I actually you have a very um, salient point um, which we can take a look at um, critical thinking. Um, I mean, there's there's an, there's other ways that we can measure it, um, especially in the district. Um, you know, now that we've got the innovation center up up and, and hopefully turning into a STEM academy over time, but it's um, one of the the dangers of uh, of data. And this is one of the things that, that I struggled with a lot as I was, was thinking my way through things, is you want it to be quick and fast and meaningful. Again, I, I'm, I'm one person um, in, I'm in, in central office um, trying to manage you know, the pandemic, keep the day-to-day keep the -day stuff happening, um, overseeing over 200 people. Um, managing all the requirements to try to receive the grant monies um, from the state for COVID, which are quite exceptional. I do all the human resources work that hits my level. Um, one of the things I don't want to get into, uh, if it's at all possible to avoid, is spending all my time collecting data. Um, so again, part of the, the decision-making process here was what are, what are some good pieces of information that we have that are meaningful that in most cases are readily available, right? That's fact the kids have to do anyway. Um, graduation uh, is, is, is uh, the state determines for us and gives us that information. Attendance is, is something, um, you know, in a normal year that we, we can generate for ourselves if we have to. But it's, um, it's quick, easy, meaningful that, 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 that is indicative that we're truly moving in the direction so yes, your your point is very well taken. Okay. 
Uh, any other questions? Really? Can I have a motion to accept the ENDS report as presented? I make a motion to accept the ENDS report as presented. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 very much Lane. Um, so next um, we need to look at our governance budget and decide on what we need. And Lane, you had some numbers. Can I really jump over a bunch of stuff Oh, oh, whoops. Yes, we did. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, get our ends monitoring. Oh, yes. So uh, from our last meeting, because some folks were, uh, had a little, um, wanted to just make sure that we were monitoring, uh, keeping our district safe in terms of the COVID response. Um, we just want an update from Lane in terms of uh, the, the COVID handbook and any changes that have had to take place uh, between our last meeting and this meeting in terms of uh, our COVID response. Our yeah, vacation. so the, the, the biggest change um, that has happened was when we started out the year, you know, they, they had this idea that when um, you get 80% of your school um, vaccinated, then, you know, mask wearing becomes optional. Um, they have pushed that date out. It started out as 10 days after the start of school. And then um, a few weeks after that, they said, no, we're gonna go to October. And now they pushed it out to November. Um, so that that date keeps changing. So that's one of the major changes um, that, that has happened that needs to be updated. Um, that was last week, I believe, the end of last week. Um, the next piece for folks to be aware about, and I put a little bit of this into the um, community message um, that was sent out um, a couple days, a couple days back, is that the state is uh, getting ready to overhaul the contact tracing testing system. Right now, we have a surveillance testing system where every Tuesday, you know, all those that have opted in um, go down to the nurse's office, uh, they get a, a COVID test, and usually within 24 to 48 hours, um, students know the results and staff know the results. And that testing is really important because it helps us identify asymptomatic uh, students and, and staff, people that may be running around in the district that don't know that they have COVID and potentially spreading it. And it, it has, uh, we did identify one which was very useful um, kind of early on. But what they're trying to do is they're recognizing that when um, you have close contacts and you put kids out on quarantine, like typically we end up shutting down a class, um, most of those kids are not going to develop COVID. And so they were trying to find a way to keep as many kids in school um, as much of the time as possible. And so they're working on what's called this test to stay uh, program, which has been done in some states around the country. So let's say that we have a, a student that tests positive in the classroom. We identify the contacts. Instead of putting those closed contacts into quarantine, what would happen is every day for seven days, uh, their parents would drive them to school in the morning. Uh, nursing staff would meet them outside. They wouldn't be allowed in the building and they would take a rapid test. If the test is negative, the student goes to school that day. If the test is positive, the student goes back home with the parent. And so they are in the beginning stages of trying to work out the logistics uh, for this test to stay program. Now, a couple of things um, that I think are important. Um, I don't know how feasible it's going to be. Um, I know that the federal government just said it's going to buy a billion, do a billion dollars worth of rapid tests. I'm not sure that the stock or the supply is available for this. Um, there is a lot of um, upset districts across the, the state um, because it was impossible for our staffs 
just to keep up with the normal con uh, surveillance, testing and contact tracing. And now potentially we're adding this piece as well. Uh, people just didn't have the staff to do it. Um, that said, I have to commend our nurses for the incredible job that they have been doing in terms of contact tracing, surveillance testing, and setting up vaccine clinics. Um, so hopefully that kind of touches that. That change isn't here yet, so it's not in, 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 in our handbook. Um, but as that gets updated and comes to fruition, that will change over. So you have uh, two reports um, in front of you that, that represents the, the, the finalized budget timeline as well as the, the parameters that would be um, reported to the board. Um, I think the timeline should be kind of self-explanatory. Um, the timeline is set up to ensure that the district's going to be in compliance with the, the mandated postings. Um, you know, when we have to have uh, the information out to the public, uh, we have our annual meeting that's defined by statute when that must be and then making sure that everybody is prepared for the actual voting date that's, that, that's typically in march um, so that timeline is there that is locked in i had the first meeting with the um the, the cabinet about a week ago on it um, and their job right now is um they are going out and they will be connecting with their school staffs to say hey um these are the critical ends. Um, you're incorporating critical ends into your evaluation process this year. Um, what resources do you need from us and the district to help you achieve these goals that, that you're setting for yourself that's gonna help us reach the, these ends? And so that discussion may generate you know, some budgetary needs. And that is the way a budget is supposed to work. We have goals that are set up here that travel down that everybody is working on but we need to take information in from the people that are actually doing the direct work with the kids trying to achieve those goals about what their needs are if this is going to happen. And that information is then used to, to, to kind of define, you know, how we either shift resources in the budget or what we ask for um, in terms of additions. Um, so that's what that, that timeline is all about. Um, you have a parameters report, um, which is really uh, a summary of the current financial landscape. Um, in other words, you know, what issues are out there that are going on either legislatively, you know, things like the pandemic, um, that could severely impact our budgeting this year. And so that's, that's what those parameters are. There was one that I left off because it's been so darn quiet. Um, that should have been on that uh, that parameters report, and that is the state of healthcare negotiations um, with the, the the union at the state level. Um, I believe at this point in time that they are uh, in arbitration, uh, but I have not seen much um, except for uh, one email um, recently from um, the Vermont Food Boards Association about the standing. I don't know if there's any questions on either of those. <clears throat> okay, any questions? Out at me. Um, 
one of the kind of rules of thumbs to use when kind of looking at this is that um, given where we are in the fiscal year, right, our fiscal year starts in July. Um, we're about a quarter of the way through, so you would expect those lines um, to be spent down by about 25%. And so most um, of those lines are, are, are in that ballpark. Um, and so right now we're, we're doing pretty well. I noticed you put the facilities report in too. Was that? Um... Yeah, that was supposed to have been in last um, at the last board meeting, uh, but the facilities crew had a lot of issues that they were mitigating at the time, didn't have time to get it complete. So I just wanted to make sure as part of your monitoring that that was not missed. Um, I think a lot of what's in there is um, self-explanatory. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that kind of jumps out um, is we've got a tremendous amount of work to do in uh, refurbishing um, food service and cafeterias across our schools. Um, a lot of the equipment and the spaces in there have kind of reached um, or are nearing the end of their useful lives. And so that's going to be a, a big piece that we're looking for. Um, we've done a significant amount of work um, in and around the district, um, getting things up uh, above what's needed uh, for, for COVID, but also just to make sure that the schools are being maintained the way that they should be. And so we're trying to get um, some resources to actually revamp the central office at this point in time, kind of re re refocus where we're at. Central office is the only building in the district um, that does not have proper ventilation and whatnot that you would expect during the pandemic. And so it's a little bit higher priority um, there at this point in time. And then the other piece, if we wanted to discuss it um, right now, um, is uh, the state of the Brookfield water, you know, the well that we were drilling to try to remediate the uh, water issues that are up there. Um, and this, this could be a pretty big topic. Um, what happened was um, when we started investigating the, the water issues up there when, when, when I came on board, um, we had an engineering crew who put together a report with uh, recommendations on how to proceed starting with the least costly to the most costly. So the first thing that they recommended was, um, you know, seal off the upper levels of the uh, old well so you're not getting deep, uh, water reaching in from the upper reaches of it. Um, we did that, it did not work. It had a little bit of effect, but nothing that was gonna make the water palatable. The second recommendation that they made was to go out and to drill a new well. And so that we have done, we worked with the state geologist. Um, we did our, I get Bob and Wes a lot of credit. They actually went out to the houses that were around and offered to test their water because they were trying to see who had the best water so that we could drill down um, into the same rock um, to draw from that, that aquifer. Um, and what ended up happening is we drilled down, I think it was 490 feet, <clears throat> and we got the same problems with the salinity um, down there. Um, there were some other things that were identified in that water that we are researching um, that have prompted a, a little bit more testing um, that needs to happen. Um, until that additional testing comes back, I'm not in a position at this point in time to really recommend what we should do um, because we need more data to decide what our potential next step is going to be. So those are the, the biggies if, if people have any questions.
have a better idea if we want to do some additional or just to check that budget to make sure it has the funding available for for board education needs so it would be okay if we sort of oh, yeah. take what you've got what's been in place or maybe we can take a look at that and make sure it's in our packet for the next board meeting and yeah. then you you currently I, I can tell you right off the top of my head um, you're currently putting aside ten thousand dollars a year for board training activities um, that has actually been very sufficient. Um, you went a little over this year um, because of the addition of the strategic planning session. Um, you know, so I think a lot of it depends upon um, how much additional training you might want to engage in. Um, you know, if, if you decide that what happened this year minus that strategic planning session is okay, 10,000 is probably reasonable. Um, if there is additional that you feel that you would like to do, then, then, then we certainly can add to it. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll um, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, at the next meeting. We'll sort of revisit that and hopefully be ready to vote on our budget for the next meeting. Um, so next up. Uh, we have the Beehive Visbit Proxy, um, and that, uh, boy, I don't remember. There's signatures in your orange oh, okay. folder in front of you. Um, you have to either decide if you're going to, somebody's going to represent at the meeting or. Right, and that's at the. Um, it's in the folder, inside the folder. Okay, that's at the annual, annual the annual meeting. That's held at I think Lake Mori. At Lake Mori. I'm not sure. Is that correct. Yeah. I don't know if they've gone virtual or something. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen yet. Lane, do you know if they're gonna do that virtually or are they gonna They they had um, they had sent out a uh, link uh, for a remote session in, in late October. Uh, don't quote me, let me take a look here, but I think it was October 27th. That's in the ballpark. Yeah, that's what's in the it's right here in the podcast. Yeah. At 530, it's a remote. Did I get the date right? You did. <laughs> you did. It's a Wednesday. So what we need to, is, are, are people planning on attending that? I usually go to that um, conference, so and I would like to this time. What's the date and time again on that? October 27th at 5.30. At 5.30. Okay. Is anyone else planning on going and anybody interested in the, the Visbit? Uh, vote is for, it's this is the uh, insurance carrier for the district. Am I correct, Lane? Yes, it is, yes. And, yeah. um, and again, that's something we sort of delegated to Lane and, and to, to do for the district, but it's a board responsibility, so one of us has to go and um, represent our board at that meeting. Um, so does any anyone, Interested in doing that? Sounds like you are. <laughs> um, I could do it <laughs> uh, since I I will probably be. I'm going to plan on being at that meeting. So sure, I'll do it. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's decided. Um, we just said we said vote, so we probably yeah. should vote. So can I have a nomination for someone to to represent the board for the VI proxy? I nominate Ann Kaplan to represent the OSP board at the visit. And I'll second that. Okay. All those any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Passes. Okay. Uh, next up, we have um, 
just taking a look at our budgeting policies. So again, remember part of what we're doing this year is um, taking a look at our policies and making sure they um, are meeting our needs. Um, so we're gonna be doing um, budgeting over the next couple of uh, meetings. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time just looking at our executive limitations around the budget. So that would be 2.3 and 2.4. And um, uh, Linda, um, please un unmute because you're controlling sound for everybody. My apologies. <laughs> Is it over here, maybe? So it's the little microphone. Hold on, it's probably over here. Sorry. Oh. Oh, God's coming. <laughs> so I'm just pulling up our our uh, our. Uh, Board policies on budgeting. Get them up. I have a policy book in. Do you want that? Do you have it right there? Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to just have you print me a copy because it's kind of a hassle. We always have to look it up. So, does everybody have a hard copy of our policy? No. Would people like to get a hard copy of the policy? Nora and Lane. I'm going to do their hands. Oh. Yes. Questions? There we go. Oh, they couldn't hear. I got yeah, I apologize. Um, we were getting feedback, and I wasn't sure what it was, and I think I shut off the one that went to the owl. <laughs> and uh, Nora, can you hear now? Okay, just making sure we got everybody. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's what I was raising my hand for too. So. <laughs> okay, so I was just, I was just um, asking board members if they wanted to have Linda. Could could you um, copy yeah, so that everybody has a who has a hard copy? I have a hard. Copy. You have a hard copy. You've got a hard copy. I I like it. Yeah, I just look it up online. Yeah. You just look it up online. Okay, so um, so we need to just take a look. So did people have a chance to take a look at those two policies? Any concerns about those two policies or changes that you would like to make to those policies? So this is uh, EL policy 2.3 and 2.4. So 2.3, I'm just going to get to it. I don't, I don't mind looking them up when I'm at home, but I'm not very fast. <laughs> um, so this is uh, financial conditions and activities. Uh, so we're looking at, um, with respect to the actual ongoing financial condition and activities, the superintendent shall not cause or allow development of financial jeopardy or material deviation of actual expenditures from board priorities established in the end. Policies uh, and in regard to as we move forward to the to the budgeting, uh, I think there were a few, that, and that was partly why we wanted to uh, take a look at this. Well, I guess this one is more in in relation to um, just that that monthly monitoring of sort of where we are in the budget. Um, and it's the financial planning and budgeting that's looking more at uh, how he's coming up with his budget and the things that we want to be watching for as we go through that process. So I just have one comment about sure. that. So in all of the financial conditions, like one through 10. Um, in a year, is there ever a year where there's like
like excess funds and you just hold on to them and carry them over to the next year and then there's more excess funds and they carry over and they keep carrying over and then you have this hundred thousand dollar excess funds that just keeps carrying over like wouldn't it make more sense to spend that on stuff that didn't put and actually you want, yeah, you want me to feel that yeah, one yes i'll let i'll let i'll let you take it <laughs> so so uh yes um typically in a normal year outside of covid um we have money left over at the end of the fiscal year those funds are called surplus funds and uh, in our case, those surplus funds, they, they, they come from a, a couple of different places. Um, typically, right, you have uh, people that retire and you hire in people that are, are lower on the pay scale. You, you plan in the budget to, to, for that more expensive person to come back, but, but, but they, they, they moved on. Um, in some cases, we have to pay for things up front, so they have to be in the budget that we get reimbursed for by the state later. So our surplus typically is in, in around the $300,000 range. Now, two things can happen with that money. Um, the first thing that can happen to it is, is kind of what uh, we did last year with last year's huge surplus, is it can go into the next budget year so that people don't have to pay as much, right? If the, the budget for next year is, is 20 million, 300,000, and I have 300,000 in surplus, I can automatically apply it um, to next year's budget, so they're only paying 20 million. Um, the other thing that we do is um, during the voting process, is people can choose uh, to help us put that money into reserve funds. So we have like a facilities reserve fund. So there's probably about 2.8 million in that reserve fund right now. That's come from years of surplus that we shifted money over to it. And why that reserve fund is important is because when big uh, projects come along, like replacing the roof on RES that we did last year that are incredibly expensive, we have the money available and don't have to go out to bond and go out into debt um, to be able to get that work done. Um, so yes, there is money at the, the end of every year. And one of the concerns, um, and we've kind of talked about it a little bit with board, but an awful lot of cabinet, is some of those reserve funds have significant amounts in them. And uh, you always want enough in there to cover what you anticipate are gonna be big things. Um, but we have enough in there that it really should go back into the service of the kids. Um, so uh, hopefully I kind of answered answer the question for you. Yes, that is my question. And so how does that process happen where we put it back into the school so you can spend it on? So, uh, if it's if it's surplus money uh, that's intended to offset next year's budget, we talk about that during the budgeting process uh, because it's something that the board board votes on, right? You you vote on the budget as a whole packet or not, so you will be in the loop on that. Um, if it's reserve money, if we have money sitting in reserves right now, typically what happens is I come to the board. This is the legal process that has to happen. And I say, hey, uh, we need to drill a well at Brookfield. It's going to cost $112,000. Um, I need you, if you're willing, as a board, to vote approval for me to take that amount of money from the reserve funds to drill that well, which is um, a process that you guys all here went through um, not, not too long ago. Lane, isn't it also true that when you Extra, the townspeople also vote on putting money into reserve funds. Mm -hmm. So that's so, something that yeah, there, there's a um, there's there's a responsibility, and it's an important one to be transparent about what you're using money for. Um, you know, that's the purpose behind the budget and why everything is spelled out, so people can take a look at where the money is going and is it going where you said it was. Um, what happens with surplus funds? money that's left over at the end of the year is uh, for that to go into a reserve fund for future use, the town on March 3rd, right, um, during the town vote, has to a vote to approve that money going into a reserve fund. And once it goes into a reserve fund, it has to be used um, for the purpose the fund was created for. So the facilities reserve fund, that money can only be used um, for, for facilities. 
We have a transportation reserve fund that we use to replace the school buses um, when we need to. That money can only be used for our vehicles in and around the district.
anybody find anything in those? I'm not a detailed person, so that would be. Anybody see anything in those meeting minutes that would come this? I move to approve the consent, consent agenda. Do we have a second? I second. Who wants to take that? I can take All right. We're going to have Megan take that. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, superintendents' reports and the newsletters from the principals. Any questions for Lane regarding those? Or, Lane, do you have anything you want to point out in uh, particular? Yeah, one, one just incidental for folks um, is that uh, there are about six or seven different master contracts um, for different categories of, of, of staff across the district and just wanted to let you know that the bus driver master agreement is up for negotiations this year um, in previous uh, iterations of the board uh, they left that to me um, and so I think that I want to find out if folks are comfortable doing that or or how you would like to work that um, I did meet with them once to get an idea of, of what they're looking for and to get uh, prepared to go out and gather the comparables um, to see in what ranges uh, other bus drivers are being paid in and around the state what benefits they may have so We'll, we'll put that on the agenda for uh, the next meeting. Sounds good. <clears throat> I will say I like seeing the um, newsletters. I thought it was fun to be able to see them from all the different schools. And it was a nice way to get that information from the principals. Mm -hmm. And a lot easier and less time consuming for the principals. Blank. Oh yes, I mean, and you can you can tell when you when you read them how much they, they put in a lot of time and effort into those. Uh, they're they're pretty informative. I think I think it's just a fantastic way um, to help connect the community with their with their schools. Lack of 
diversity. I mean, there is no, I mean, it was just, so a five, um, participation was well balanced. Four, probably, um, members listened attentively, probably a five. Respectfulness, a five, and work accomplished in an atmosphere of trust and openness was also a five. Pretty good. Thank you very much. All right, we do have an executive session. Um, so we, oh boy, they're gonna help me out on this, right? We adjourn, or we don't adjourn yet. We, yeah. we go into executive session. We session. Enter executive session. Okay, so do I have a motion to move into executive session? I think a motion we move into executive session. I will second it. So, any discussion on that? We have a question. Oh, we have a question. Yes, Nora. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask them or not. Are, after executive session, are, are you going to come back to, to discuss things? Or, um, I guess I guess my big question is, should we be waiting? Or um, will things be put into writing? And, and how do we find out what was decided? Uh, if we make a decision, it has to be made out in the general meeting. Um, so when we come out of executive session, if we are going to make a motion, you'll you you would see that motion. So you, if you okay. want to see it, but it on. also would be recorded. And, and it would be recorded in the notes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Linda. Yeah. Um, if your computer is the one managing the owl, that will have to stay on. Um, so that when people exit, when the board exits out of this session, um, it still exists when we come back. Okay. I'll have to get Todd probably. <laughs> so who's doing the executive session? Yeah. Let me see if I can get him. It's a, it, it, it's and, and right now, I think you'll have to stop. You can't.